very nice to meet all of you and uh, to really thrilled to be here and to talk more about my own path out of the corporate world into trying to work with the developing world. And it's a bit ironic because they asked me to speak about corporate social responsibility. And in a certain sense, what I did is I left a corporation in order to devote my life towards social responsibility. Now what I'm trying to do is help to bridge that chasm and get a lot more executives and a lot more companies involved in working to make life better for children throughout the developing world. What I want to talk about today, my topic is a passion to change the world through the power of education. My name is John Wood, and I'm the founder and CEO of a group called Room to Read, a San Francisco-based NGO that is trying to do whatever we can to help as many children throughout the developing world. The core belief of Room to Read can be summed up in six key words. World change starts with educated children. If you think about the state of the world today and how depressing it can be and how messed up it can seem, a lot of times I wonder, why have we not gotten back to the basics of trying to make sure that every child throughout the world, no matter how poor their country, no matter how poor their parents, no matter how poor their government, why can we not give every child access to schools, books, libraries, and teachers from a young age? I think much of what's happening in the world today in terms of aid is just basically putting band-aids on existing problems. And I think education is the great equalizer. Education brings opportunity to children who would not otherwise have it. Each of us probably can close our eyes right now and visualize a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent who may have been the first person from your family to get a complete education, be it high school or college, and to have moved your family and all subsequent generations of your family from perhaps poverty to the middle class or perhaps the upper class. And what we want to do is reach out to these kids in the developing world because there are literally 800 million people in the developing world who lack basic literacy. 800 million people who cannot read or write their name. Uh, Chairman Mao once said that um, uh, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. And there are times I'm overwhelmed by that statistic of 800 million people. What I try to do is close my eyes and think about that girl I met in Nepal who was on a scholarship through Room to Read, or the village that we worked with in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam to open a new school. Our ambitions for Room to Read are very, very big. We want to help at least 10 million children to gain the lifelong gift of education. It's a very ambitious goal. I, I think we're going to be able to do it. Now, there's, again, even if we do that, there's still 790 million other people in the developing world who don't have literacy. So we have a lot of work to do, and I hope that many of you who are thinking about what comes next in your own life will adopt this cause as your own, because we can make a huge change in the world if we try to get more kids in school and, and gaining the lifelong gift of education. I want to talk first about how Room to Read got started. Many of you may be on your own personal journey to try to figure out what comes next for you. I went through that for a number of years. In my case, I was working at Microsoft from 1991 to 1999. And it was a very fast-paced life, very hectic. I was running significant parts of our international business. I was director of marketing for Microsoft Australia, based out of Sydney, which, as far as boondoggles go, is, is a pretty good corporate boondoggle to get living in Sydney. And somebody from HR was kind enough to do the research and give me a 20% cost of living adjustment for, li for a hardship allowance for living in Sydney. Um, the only real hardship, though, was the long hours. And one day, my friend Ben said to me, we have to go check out this slideshow that an adventure travel company is doing on Nepal, the Annapurna circuit. And this picture here is a shot of some of the mountains that you can circumnavigate in Nepal. And I, I visualized going out to these mountains and escaping from work for a while. This is an 18-day trek. And I had never been to Nepal, but I visualized going there. And for me, the goal was to hit this place called the Thurong Law Pass. It was a 10-day walk uphill to an 18,000-foot pass. And I visualized a life for three weeks with, you know, escaping my cell phone, escaping my email, escaping the dreaded Monday morning management team meeting, um, escaping from certain unnamed executives who are driving me crazy. <laughs> um, there was a rumor that if you went high enough into the Himalayas, you could not hear Steve Ballmer yelling at you. And that, that was really appealing to me because in my, in my dreams, I was having this vision of Steve's big bald head yelling, you're not making your numbers. You're not making your numbers in Vietnam. And we thought about, wow, what, wouldn't it be great to just kind of get out for a while and escape from all this? 
Nepal is a beautiful country. It is one of the world's poorest countries. It is, um, has adults living on a dollar a day and it has 70% illiteracy rate. So as much as it's a beautiful place, it's also a country that has significant problems. In this case, when I was in Nepal, I talked to some people and I, who were who Nepali citizens, and I said, why is your literacy rate so high? And they explained that the parents and the government were too poor to afford education, universal education. The elite got educated, but the broad middle class and the masses did not get educated. And I said, but if you don't have educated citizens, how will you ever not be poor? And that seemed like a very cruel catch-22 to be in for a country, but it also seemed like a cruel situation for a three- or four- or five-year-old child to be in to literally have a child who's lost the lottery of life. If you're born in Ottawa or you're born in Vancouver, you get to go to school and get an education. If you're born in rural Nepal, the nearest school may be a four-hour walk away and you don't get to go to school. So I didn't think so much that I was going to go to Nepal and do anything that was more special than just kind of escaping from work. But what happened to me is a two days walk along the trek I met a school headmaster and a guy called the district resource person for that province, and they invited me to come see their school. And I was really excited because I wanted to see, well, how, what is you know, the situation like for kids in Nepal and for people in Nepal? So when they invited me to come see the school, we had to cross this rather scary series of rickety bridges to get to this school. And this bridge in particular, the biggest problem we had was that there was actually a donkey train coming over it as we were halfway across, and I don't know if you know much about donkeys, but they don't actually have a reverse gear. And if I was scared in this bridge, the donkeys were even more scared. So it was a, you know, kind of tested my ability to run backwards pretty quickly. On the other side of this bridge was a school that ended up, for me, changing my life. The school you see here, just a rickety collection of mud and straw with a leaky sheet metal roof. And during the rainy season, the roof leaked and the dirt floors turned to mud. And the headmaster said, a rainy day is a holiday. So during the entire monsoon season, the kids couldn't work the fields, but they also couldn't go to school. And I thought to myself, wow, we live in a world of such abundance, yet here's 450 students in this school who have just terrible conditions. The headmaster invited me to see the school's library. And that really excited me. I don't know how many of you in the audience were kind of library geeks as a kid. Oh, come on, like four of you raised your hand. If you're here today, you may have been a library geek during your earlier life. Uh, I know I was. When the headmaster invited me to see the school's library, I got this very hopeful vision in my head. I thought, you know, a library will have a bunch of happy kids reading books. And when the headmaster walked me over to the library, the reality was just so different. It was just this big, empty room. A library could have existed in this room but it did not have shelves, it did not have desks or chairs, and most importantly, it did not have books. And God knows I did not want to be an obnoxious American and ask the question, but I had to. I said, where exactly are your library's books? And the headmaster explained they were in a cabinet in the back of the room, locked up, because the books were so precious, because there were so few of them. And they yelled for the teacher who had the one key to the rusty padlock where the books were locked up, and when he finally showed up and showed me the school's treasure trove of books, there were only about 20 books in the, in the cabinet, and they were all completely inappropriate for children. They were just backpacker cast-offs, things that sympathetic trekkers had left behind. Totally inappropriate for children. I am not a literary snob by any means. I, I think every child should read Danielle Steele romance novels at some part of their pedagogical development. <laughs> but certainly seeing these 450 eager young learners and, you know, Gunter Grass novels and Umberto Eco novels um, that obviously Trekkers had gotten frustrated with, you know, the tin drum by page 20 and then decided to donate it to this school so the kids could enjoy it. I, I, I thought, what can I do to help? And I wondered to myself, would it be obnoxious to offer? Who am I as like this wealthy, young, white American kid to, to offer this headmaster and say, I can help you? And thankfully, he saved me the trouble. Chapter one of my book is titled, Perhaps, Sir, You Will Someday Come Back With Books. That was his humble request. And in my own mind, I got this really good feeling. I got this big, goofy, goofy grin on my face. I literally um, had this vision of helping this headmaster. And for myself, I thought, you know what? I could be the Andrew Carnegie of Bahundanda, Nepal.